I'll, I'll begin the meeting. This will be recorded so people can go back and listen to it um, at your convenience. If you have to jump off early, you'll be able to catch up on everything. Um, so let's begin. Welcome everyone. Uh, welcome to PV Chambers virtual panel discussion. My name is Renee Blumstrom and I'm the executive director of the Park Yeoman Valley Chamber of Commerce and I will be your host today. This free event is intended to bring you the most up-to-date information about the COVID vaccines. I want to say special thanks to our event sponsors, Kelly Insurance and also SMB Event Concepts and Catering. And I do see Saudia, uh, the chef from SMB, chef and owner, there she is waving on our call today. Um, their information will be posted to our COVID-19 resource page, the webinar tab for this event. Before we get started, I just wanna cover a few logistics to make sure we all have a positive experience. Uh, please note, your the participants uh, lines have been muted during this first portion of the program. The doctors will be happy to answer questions. Uh, you can submit them by entering it in the chat box. So if you go to the bottom of your screen, if you're new to Zoom, go to the bottom of the screen, there'll be a chat icon. Select that and you can enter your questions um, there. Be sure to press uh, enter so that we can see the questions. Um, and just bear with me today as we toggle, we're gonna go back and forth. We have two presenters and we'll be monitoring the chat box throughout. So have some patience. Uh, the Chamber is committed to community prosperity through advocacy, access to leaders, economic development, networking, and business education. This program is just one example of how we've adapted our programs this year, moving them to virtual platforms to meet the needs of our members and residents while keeping everyone safe. Our first guest speech, speaker today is Robert, Dr. Robert McMurtry, board certified anesthesiologist and pain management specialist. Dr. McMurtry is chief medical officer at Phoenixville Hospital Tower Health. He has a special interest in improving population health and the patient experience while reducing the cost of healthcare. In addition to his medical degree, Dr. Rink Murtry holds a master's degree in business administration from the University of Scranton with specializations in both operations management and healthcare management. Our second guest speaker today is Dr. Brian Broker, a board certified ENT specialist and surgeon and president of, and president of ENT and allergy specialists. In addition, Dr. Broker is Chief Medical Officer and founding board member of the Physicians Integrated Network. TPIN was founded to empower independent physicians, medical groups, and ambulatory facilities to sustain their roles as healthcare leaders to improve, coordinate, and deliver comprehensive care in a value-based delivery environment. Before I turn the mic over to Dr. McMurtry, I'd like to remind everyone to keep your audio settings on mute and use the chat feature to submit questions. After Mc Dr. McMurtry speaks about the current available vaccines, Dr. Broker will speak about changes in recommendations for those who are vaccinated. And again, at the end of the presentation, we will open the floor to audience Q&A. At this time, it gives me great pleasure to introduce Dr. Robert McMurtry. All right, so bear with me and let's see how I do with sharing my screen. Okay, how are we doing? Let's Super. Okay. Uh, so good day, everyone. Uh, and I'd like to thank Renee Blomstrom and Perkium and Valley Chamber of Commerce for hosting this discussion and Dr. Brian Broker for coordinating our efforts. Today, we will discuss COVID-19 vaccines, variants, defense and mitigation, and recommendations after vaccination. Uh, there is a lot of information on the internet and not all of it helpful. Uh, the Pennsylvania Department of Health and the CDC are two of the main resources that your healthcare professionals use to make decisions. Uh, so they are highly recommended. 
and Monco and Johns Hopkins websites are also useful resources. If you remember anything today, please remember this information. Patients should not risk health by delaying routine, urgent, and emergency medical care. Hospitals are open, safe, and ready to deliver all health care. I have seen firsthand people who have delayed even emergent medical care like strokes due to fear of COVID. You are more likely to get COVID shopping or from family and friends than you are at the hospital. Get vaccinated, wear a mask, physical distance, avoid crowds, and continue hand hygiene. The best vaccine is whichever one is offered to you. There is hope and there is light on the horizon and we must not let our guards down. March 10 was the one year anniversary of the first COVID patient at Phoenixville Hospital. Uh, light on the horizon is the positive trend that we've observed with decreasing inpatient admissions for COVID, decreasing test positivity rate, decreasing number of ICU patients, and decreasing ICU patients who require ventilators. Even with these positive trends, we must remain vigilant. Another light on the horizon is the increase in U.S. vaccination numbers, with nearly 12% of the total U.S. population fully vaccinated and nearly 22% receiving at least one dose. Another light on the horizon is increase in Pennsylvania vaccination numbers, with over 11% of the Pennsylvania population fully vaccinated. Every week, we have more and more individuals getting first doses and fully vaccinated. In just the last week, uh, we've had an increase in over 18% in first doses and nearly 35% in fully vaccinated individuals. Here we have Montgomery County and our neighbors, with Monco doing better than Pennsylvania overall in getting people vaccinated, and Chester County is not that far behind. The Montgomery County Office of Public Health sponsors two vaccination clinics, in addition to vaccinations provided by hospitals mm -hmm. and pharmacies. These registration and dose numbers do not include vaccine obtained or given by providers outside of the Office of Public Health, such as hospitals and pharmacies. At the advisement of the CDC, Pennsylvania is prioritizing the order in which individuals are vaccinated in accordance with recommendations of the CDC Advisory Committee on Immunization Practices. In addition to healthcare personnel, EMS first responders, and residents and staff of congregate care settings like nursing homes, these individuals are currently el eligible for vaccines. All persons age 65 and older, and all persons age 16 to 64 with the high-risk conditions note. The FDA has approved three vaccines under emergency use authorization for administration in the United States. Pfizer is a messenger RNA vaccine given in two doses, 21 days apart. Moderna is a messenger RNA vaccine given in two doses, 28 days apart. And Johnson & Johnson is a viral vector vaccine currently given in one dose. So which vaccine is best? The first one offered to you. All three available vaccines are 100% effective in preventing death from COVID and are highly effective in preventing serious infections. None of the vaccines are live or dead or inactive virus. The messenger RNA vaccines by Pfizer and Moderna and the viral vector vaccine by Johnson & Johnson work differently to develop spike proteins to stimulate an immune response and train our bodies to respond to the actual coronavirus that causes COVID-19. These vaccines do not change your DNA. All three vaccines have shown to offer some protection against the Great Britain variant and the South African variant. The researchers are still studying the vaccines against these variants. Vaccines are not mandatory. COVID vaccine, is not even mandatory for healthcare workers. Though vaccines are not mandatory, you should use all the tools possible to beat COVID. Vaccines, masks, hand hygiene, physical distancing, and avoiding crowds. The three vaccines currently available in the US were all 100% effective in preventing death from COVID. 
and that's a pretty good reason for getting the vaccine. Getting COVID-19 may give you some natural protection known as immunity, and we do not know how much protection this gives or how long this protection lasts. So the risk of severe illness and death from COVID-19 far outweighs any benefits of immunity from COVID. You cannot get COVID-19 from any of the vaccines. The vaccines do not contain any live virus or dead virus, and you cannot test positive for COVID-19 by getting vaccinated. Anyone who is in the active stage of an acute COVID infection or who has been in close contact with a person who has had a COVID positive test result should remain in self-isolation or quarantine and not come to a vaccination site. Individuals are recommended to wait at least seven days after symptoms resolve to receive the vaccine. So this way you'll have an adequate immune response. Individuals are recommended to wait 14 days between COVID vaccination and other vaccinations like influenza or the shingles vaccine or Pneumovax. Common side effects include local reactions of redness, swelling, and pain at the injection site, fever, tiredness, headaches, new or worsening muscle aches. These are usually worse after the second dose. The side effects are a normal reaction and show that your body is having an immune response. Side effects usually start within a day or two after getting the vaccine and go away in a couple days. You can typically manage the side effects with hydration and Tylenol. Call your PCP if your side effects are worrying you or do not seem to be going away after a few days. The messenger RNA vaccines on rare occasions, like 11 cases out of 18 million vaccinations, have triggered a severe reaction called anaphylaxis that can be treated with epinephrine. No one suffered an allergic reaction in clinical trials with the vector viral vector vaccine by Johnson & Johnson. This severe kind of reaction called anaphylaxis almost always occurs within 30 minutes after vaccination. Fortunately, vaccination providers have medicines available to effectively and immediately treat patients who experience anaphylaxis following vaccination. Any of the currently authorized COVID-19 vaccines can be offered to people who are pregnant or breastfeeding. The CDC classifies pregnancy as a high-risk condition. Based on how these vaccines work in the body, experts believe they're unlikely to pose a specific risk for people who are pregnant or breastfeeding. However, there is very limited information on the use of COVID-19 vaccines in pregnant people. The Pfizer and Moderna messenger RNA vaccine are theoretically safe during pregnancy because they do not contain live virus. The Johnson & Johnson viral vector vaccine is similar to the vaccine for Ebola, which has been studied extensively in women who are pregnant or breastfeeding. Pfizer is currently studying vaccination in pregnant women. The Pfizer vaccine is not yet approved for children under the age of 16. The Moderna and Johnson & Johnson vaccines are not yet approved for children under the age of 18. More research is needed to make sure any COVID-19 vaccine will be safe and effective for infants, kids, and teens, and more research is ongoing. The need for and timing for COVID-19 booster doses have not been established, so no additional doses are recommended at this time. So are there any contraindications to the vaccine? The CDC considers a history of the following to be a contraindication to vaccination with COVID-19 vaccines. A severe allergic reaction or anaphylaxis after a previous dose or to a component of the COVID-19 vaccine, or an immediate allergic reaction of any severity to a previous dose, or known diagnosed allergy to a component of the vaccine. So polyethylene glycol and polysorbate are closely related to each other. Polyethylene glycol is an ingredient in the messenger RNA vaccines by Pfizer and Moderna. And polysorbate is an ingredient in the Johnson & Johnson vaccine. If you are allergic to polyethylene glycol, you should not get a messenger RNA vac vaccine and ask your doctor if you can get the Johnson & Johnson vaccine. If you are allergic to polysorbate, you should not get the Johnson & Johnson vaccine. 
and ask your doctor if you can get a messenger RNA vaccine with Pfizer or Moderna. So with that, I'd like to please welcome Dr. Brian Broker to discuss COVID defense and mitigation, as well as recommendations after vaccination. Great, thank you very much, Rob. Um, it's a great talk and uh, thanks Renee for having both of us today. Um, I think it's a very important and timely topic, I think for our community and, uh, and, and for the chamber and for the members of the chamber for businesses locally. Um, and I think it's also helpful to hear a little bit about, I'll talk a little bit about some of the things going on in schools. So first, let's see if I can get my screen up here. Yeah. So here. And there. Great. Okay. So everybody see the slides there? Okay. So as uh, Dr. McMurtry had said, you know, benefits of the COVID vaccine are going to be significant. And we're going to talk about it. Um, but with these fewer restrictions that are just starting to happen, very important that we all stay very vigilant because um, I'm going to mix some metaphors here, but I think it's important to think about. So, you know, we see a light at the end of the tunnel, but we're not out of the woods yet. So we have to be careful. And we're going to talk about that. So, all right. So Dr. Murphy had talked about some of these numbers. Um, I, want, I like to boil them down to actual numbers. I, for me, it gives me a better understanding. Um, you know, U.S. population is about 330 million people. Um, people over 18, about 250 million. People 18 and under, about 75 million. Um, as of yesterday, I, I pulled these numbers off. About 71 million people have at least one dose of the vaccine. Um, and we're currently giving about 2.4 million vaccine shots a day. The government estimates we'll have enough doses to get all the adults vaccinated by the end of May. Right now, it's kind of the low-hanging fruit. We have a uh, low supply, but a high demand. That's likely to flip, which will slow some completion of getting all the shots done because uh, as we start to vaccinate all the people that are really clamoring for it right now, we're going to end up uh, still with a bunch of people who are fence sitters, not sure if they want to get it, or some people who just don't think they want to get it because they're concerned about something about the vaccine. Um, and we really want to try and get everybody vaccinated for us to get the most immunity. So that's very important. And so there's a lot of efforts to try and um, persuade those people that the vaccine is helpful for them as well as for their community. And then also uh, challenges to vaccinate kids. Um, some of the things to vaccinate children right now, you may have heard that some children have been uh, finding the getting an um, autoimmune response uh, to the children that do get this, although it's few. Um, and so there's concern that, you know, could that kind of thing happen with a vaccine? It's not likely, but those studies are important to finish to be sure that it's safe in kids. So that's what they're gonna finish. And they're looking around, uh, like Thanksgiving or maybe Christmas to start vaccinating kids. So soon, but we have time to go. Um, fully vaccinated persons essentially are people two weeks after the final dose, whether you got the one shot or two shot. Um, but as Dr. McMurtry had said, it's important to know that for all three vaccines, there are no hospitalizations or deaths um, two weeks after. Um, and so that's important to know. You're also then far less likely to get mild, moderate, or severe disease and you're far less likely to transmit the disease. So those three things are extremely important and have implications for what we can start to do, how we can start to see a little bit of normalcy in our lives. And I think for the chamber today, it's very important for us to think about how that might affect businesses. So we're gonna chat about that. So what's changed from the CDC? So the CDC has new recommendations that they've put out just last week about what you can do after you're fully vaccinated. So people that have, fully vaccinated may gather indoors with other fully vaccinated people without wearing a mask. Um, that's a big deal. The example that they use on the CDC site, they say, oh, you can ask your neighbors to come over for dinner um, if everybody's had their vaccine. So, you know, that's important. We can start to socialize a little bit once we've all had our vaccine. Um, you can gather indoors with unvaccinated people from one other household without masks. And I think that the big effort there really was talking about grandparents seeing their grandchildren. Not a small thing. Um, it's been a really big problem for the past year for families. So that's a big deal that you can get together with your family. And if you think about it, you know, the adults um, in your 
children's family may be vaccinated, but the grandchildren, too young to get the vaccine still, but that's okay. Uh, if the grandparents are vaccinated, they can come over, they can take off their masks and the family can start to get together again. The one exception is if anybody in the house has increased risk of severe illness from COVID-19, then everybody should still wear their masks. And then of course, if you're exposed to COVID-19, people don't need to quarantine anymore after the vaccine or they don't need to get tested either if they've been exposed. Um, now this, of course, if they're not in a group setting and this has to do with statistics. So it turns out that you're far less likely to get it or transmit it, but there's a very small chance. So if you're in a group setting, there's a lot more people, the odds are just higher because there's a lot more people. Okay, so what should you not do differently? So here's what hasn't changed. You still wanna protect yourself and others by making sure you wear a mask, you want to be six feet apart. You want to avoid crowds, poorly ventilated spaces whenever you're in public, whether you're gathering with unvaccinated people from more than one household, or whether you're visiting unvaccinated people who are at increased risk of getting COVID-19. We still want to avoid those medium and large side gatherings again, because even though your risk once you're vaccinated is very small, when you add up a whole bunch of people in a large gathering, now the risk is higher. So still staying away from the medium and large gatherings, still delaying travel. And if you develop symptoms, regardless, you have to treat it like you may have it, even if you had your vaccine. So you're still gonna get tested and quarantined um, if you've got symptoms, even after the vaccine. Okay, and then you're gonna follow any workplace restrictions. So where are we now in Pennsylvania? So I, I like this little graph, uh, this is from the Department of Health. And at the bottom, you can see the colors. So you know, the, the darker red color, substantial transmission. And if you look at the bottom right of Pennsylvania there, you probably all know what the counties look like. Um, you know, Montgomery and Chester County um, are in the moderate range of community transmission, but still Bucks, Delaware, and Philadelphia are in the higher rate of community transmission. So, you know, from a business perspective, when you're thinking about what you're gonna do, comfort level and having um, patrons come into your business, and for your employees, you still need to take these precautions. Um, and just to put it in graph form, this is yesterday from Department of Health numbers. If you look at the columns at the top, we're looking at the difference in confirmed cases from seven days now to prior seven days. And if you look at all the counties, it's going down, which is good, all the right direction. The incident rate for the past seven days per 100,000 people. So that's how many people in each county have the illness per 100,000 people. Now, for it to be the low risk of transmission, you wanna see that number 10 or under per 100,000, 10. And severe is over 100 per 100,000. So moderate is 10 to 100. So if you look at Bucks, Delaware, and Philadelphia, they're still all over 100. That's still the severe rate of transmission. Montgomery and Chester are better. They're under 100, but they're not near 10. So we still have a lot of people in all those counties that have this, that's where we are. Now the PCR positivity rate, that tells you where we're going because that tells how many people were just tested positive. And so that rate you wanna see under 4% to expect it to continue to drop at a good rate. So if it's over 10%, that's bad, that's high. Four to 10% is moderate. So if you look all the counties, there's still four to 10%. None of us are really under 4% there. So that really tells you that while Montgomery and Chester are doing well, still not out of the woods, still have to be careful. And then of course the change in daily hospitalizations is going down too, and that's always a good number. All right, so what's coming next? And I think this is the most important thing I think for the businesses, members of the chamber to be thinking about, vaccine passports. You may have seen some of these ads on TV. Um, the larger companies have heavily invested in this, Amazon's invested in this. Um, uh, there's uh, a, a all the sporting companies um, uh, and sports entertainment corporations are investing in this. Uh, and many of the airlines have invested heavily in these. So you'll see a lot of these things pop up in uh, airports. Clear is a company that's in all the airports to try and get you through uh, the, um, uh, the uh, security check-ins quickly before there was COVID. And now they're gonna add in a health pass too. Um, but these are basically apps you can get on your phone that'll tell you and if you've had your uh, vaccine. Um, and why is that helpful? Well, because over time, what you're going to start to see is the occupancy requirements uh, be relaxed. And so that you'll start to let more people into your business. Um, the one question that's outstanding right now is restaurants. It's unclear if this will change the occupancy requirements for patrons eating without their masks on at this time. 
but that is going to change as more of the population starts to get vaccinated. Um, and then New York State has actually partnered with IBM for their digital health pass. And you may have seen these advertisements on TV. Um, I think it's uh, uh, Clear's health pass that's advertising on television uh, with a bunch of uh, well-known uh, musicians and other actors and showing on the, the window of your business if you haven't been approached already for these stickers to say that you're uh, using this health pass and you're giving some level of confidence to your patrons and your employees when they come in uh, that there's going to be people, everybody in, the, in, the, in your establishment is going to be vaccinated. Um, and I think that over time, uh, that's going to also create an important incentive for people who are fence sitters to get vaccinated. So from my perspective, um, that's something that I would advocate strongly for all of the businesses uh, in the chamber to adopt um, is to start using this because the more people who do it, the more people who are going to have an impetus to want to get their vaccine. So I think that's very important. And then lastly, just a word about schools, because everybody wants to know about schools. Um, the Pennsylvania State Education Association recommends full-time in-person learning to the counties that are uh, mild and moderate transmission right now, although the CDC likes to say only the mild transmission. Um, the state and the State Department of Health are recommending for the moderate transmission. There was a really good study that looked over six months out of all the counties in Massachusetts that still had kids back to school starting in September. Um, it was published in the Annals of Infectious Disease, and it showed that three feet distance is just as good at six foot distance in allowing schools to uh, open if they are following all the other mitigation measures, including mass ventilation and hygiene, uh, and there was no more risk of transmission in those schools. That's important because the difference between three foot and six foot is what lets the schools get all the kids back in so there's enough room. If you're trying six foot distance, they can't get all the kids back in. And I can tell you just uh, last night or two nights ago, two nights ago, um, Phoenixville School District just voted to have all the kids come back in full time if the parents decide to, they also have options. So a lot of the school districts are giving the parents options not to have them come back full time, but they are allowing it. And then of course, very important that uh, the government, both federal and the state, um, has made it their goal to get all the teachers vaccinated by the end of March with the single shot vaccine from Johnson & Johnson uh, because it's quicker to get done and because the results are really just as good as the other two vaccines. And this way we get the kids back maybe for last marking period, which starts in April. So that's important. So that's the end of the talk. And I uh, want to thank everybody for listening and uh, happy to take questions. Renee, you're still on mute. There it is. Thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, both doctors. And um, so we do, we do have a few questions. I can run down uh, a few of these questions and either one of you can jump in to answer. Um, our sure. first one is, will AstraZeneca be approved here? AstraZeneca is uh, currently doing more studies. Uh, the FDA requires a certain amount of trials. Uh, so AstraZeneca is still working on their phase three study results. And um, according to NBC News, uh, that they are supposed to uh, submit late March, early April uh, for emergency use authorization by the FDA. Uh, so we'll see. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Wink Murtry. Um, do you think the COVID-19 vaccinations will be recommended annually, such as the flu shot? Yeah, that's it. I'll take that one, Rob. I think it's a good question. The, um, the difference is going to be, are they going to find variants? And I think everybody's familiar that the flu shot has, has because there's variants of the flu. We've already seen a lot of variants for this particular one. Um, and so far, the... Um, the vaccines that are approved here have a very good efficacy against uh, the other variants. So um, for the moment, we're not seeing a need for it, but the research is ongoing and they're going to continue to follow this. Most experts starting now are leaning towards it's likely that we'll probably get booster shots year after year. Thank you. Um, here's another one. 
Recommendations for children. I know you touched a little bit about this, Dr. Broker. Uh, recommendations for children who want to go to overnight camp this summer. Uh, could they go if counselors are vaccinated and all take prior COVID tests? Sure. So um, I actually haven't seen any studies that were done in kids in overnight camps. There were some for day camps. Um, and the day camps fared very well. They had extremely low transmission rates, just like the schools. And this was before there was vaccines. This was last summer. Um, so I, I suspect that they're going to say, yeah, they think it's safe to do. Yeah. Another one, if uh, too many people refuse to get the vaccine, will that defeat the herd immunity goal? So that's a good yeah. question. Like how many people do we need to be vaccinated? According to uh, Dr. Fauci, we need at least 70%. I've heard up to 85% uh, of the population to be vaccinated for us to reach herd immunity. So yeah, I mean, right now, so we're 22% of the population with at least one dose. Uh, so we're well on our way uh, with the increased numbers of vaccinations happening every day. But yeah, if too many uh, people do refuse, yeah, we do risk uh, that herd immunity. That's why it's, you know, my job and Dr. Broker's job to provide as much real information as possible mm -hmm. and for people mm -hmm. to look at reliable sources of information um, because there's a lot of myths and uh, untruths out there uh, that are dissuading people uh, from getting vaccinated. Um, so medical issues aside, just misinformation is... Uh, is dissuading people. So I'm, you know, I'm happy to have conversations with people uh, just to have a discussion open for debate, uh, just to see why they may or may not. Um, and some of, you know, the myths of, oh, it's the chip or whatever is being injected into the COVID vaccine. It's, you know, all the different things. And again, if it's 100% effective in preventing death from COVID, I think that's a pretty good reason to get the vaccine. Yeah, if I could add something to that too, Renee, um, this is why I, I was talking about the, the health passes and the, the health passports from the vaccine. Um, there were 100 healthcare workers at the Super Bowl who were using a health pass. Um, and I, the, the NFL has said that they're going to start using health pass to come to see their games. Um, and that's why I'm, I'm such a strong advocate of uh, other businesses. And, and, and I would encourage the chamber to consider endorsing the health passes too because I think that that is going to prove people are, have a, a feeling that they're sheltered in people want to get out they want to do things mm -hmm. they want to visit businesses they want to go to restaurants and I think it will not only give a business advantage to the businesses that will make their patrons feel safe and their employees feel safe but I think it'll provide a very helpful and I think necessary impetus for a lot of those fence sitters to decide you know I I think I'd like to go to a restaurant. Yeah, I'm going to get the vaccine because I want to go out to eat. And that may sound like a small reason to decide, but I think that that's why a lot of the people who are sitting on the fence, I think that's how they're going to decide. So. I think you still have that challenge of those folks, you know, we talked about this back in August when you presented, there's people that are against the mask and feel that, you know, people shouldn't tell them that they need to wear it. So I think it'll be interesting to see how that plays out with the health pass and um, people choose not to get it than not being able to enter a, a facility that's requiring it. Sure, but I think, the, and I, I agree exactly, and that's the point that I think I'm making is that, is that I think that the, the, um, the difference between the government saying there's a mass mandate and private businesses saying, you know, you're, you're welcome not to get the vaccine, but you just can't come to dinner here. Mm -hmm. um, you know, those same people, those people that are talking about their individual rights also recognize the individual rights of the businesses to decide. Mm -hmm. And then it becomes a personal thing. Well, all right, I, I want to go to an Eagles game and I'm not going to that Eagles game unless I get my vaccine. So <laughs> guess what? I'm getting my vaccine. Yeah. So, yeah. So if that's what it takes to get them to a football game, oh, that's, that's fine. <laughs> we just need everyone vaccinated. Yep. Uh, let's see, we had some more questions. If too many people refuse to get the vaccine, will that defeat the herd immunity goal? Which I think you touched upon. And then the second part is, should pregnant women wait until after 24 weeks when organs are formed before getting the vaccine? So again, uh, 
pregnancy is considered a high risk medical condition. So it is even for women who are undergoing fertility treatments uh, and those that are pregnant and those that are breastfeeding, uh, there's not a contraindication to vaccination. And is that because it doesn't enter the DNA? Because it's not a, for some of the other ones, whether it's measles, mumps, pertussis, things like that, uh, depending on the vaccine, since these have no virus whatsoever, that's why it's thought to be safe. Because it's actually just developing that little spike, but not actually any virus. Okay, great. Is there a reason why a person should not get the vaccine? According to the CDC, really, the only contraindication is the, you know, allergic reactions to the components, whether it's the polyethylene glycol or the polysorbate, or if you have had a reaction to a previous dose. Uh, that is really the only um, absolute contraindication. And I've been hearing from uh, my lucky friends who have already received the vaccine, um, dose, dose two of the Moderna and the Pfizer um, can uh, result in some side effects, some achy, fever, chills. Um, is there, this is kind of a two-part question, is there a, a side effect to the one dose J&J &J, that's similar to that second dose on the other two? Start with that. Sure. So I can hit that one. So um, yeah, the J&J &J is having similar um, side effects, although to a lesser degree um, in the reports than for the other vaccines. Um, and, you know, it's, it's important to emphasize that while the side effects are uncomfortable in the short term, it does mean that the vaccine is doing its job and working. So it's not necessarily bad to have it. It's a question of just you being comfortable going through it. And then, you know, a follow-up to that question is a lot of people want to know, well, should I take some ibuprofen? Should I take some Tylenol um, to feel a little bit better and calm the reaction down? And what we tell our patients, because um, uh, we're actually starting to get the vaccine in our office to give out to patients here, is that um, uh, you, can, you can take the Tylenol and the Motrin um, and, you know, you're really not going to decrease the vaccine response to any significant degree. Um, and so we tell people, take what you need to just to get through it, but take as little as you can. And that's how we present it. Okay. And um, I've been hearing that people that are um, older in that older senior population, the, the side effects might not be as severe to them as they are to the younger folks. Does that have to do with their um, immune system? That's the thought is that older individuals are having less side effects due to the immune systems. But it's still effective for them. Yeah. Okay. All right. Let me just see if we got through all of the questions. And Dr. Brooker, you mentioned that you are um, starting to get vaccines at your office. Can you tell us how people sign up for that? Oh, sure. Just go to our, our uh, web page, our homepage, um, and it's right on the front. And so it's uh, ENT and allergy specialists with an S at the end, dot com. And then you can just sign up right on the web page for it. Okay. And we'll put that information up on our, our chamber resource page with this uh, recording right. so they can contact you with any questions. Um, but it's still, all of these sites across Pennsylvania are still uh, administering this by tiers. Right. So the 1A, 1B. Right, right, right. Yeah, we're all, we're all required to follow the state regulations. So we're all still right now in state 1A. And you'll, and you'll see, if you go to our website, you'll see exactly what the tiers are and where you fall in. And it has you go through the questions to the, just determine that you're in that category at this time. I have a neighbor who has diabetes and is not in that category. I guess she doesn't have the type of diabetes. That's, I think the the first category specifies which type of diabetes, right, uh, yeah. to require that. And they don't feel that all types are risk are more more at risk for this. Right, like not the same risk, like a lower risk. That's true. 
Although, you know, it really depends on um, uh, the, the volume of the vaccine doses that, we're, that this, the state of Pennsylvania is getting. Um, you know, I expect that we're going to get to the, the 1C, which will include the rest of the diabetics, um, probably within two weeks, um, hopefully, if things are going the way they are. Some states, um, you know, Alaska last week just announced that it's a much smaller state, so they have fewer require, you know, fewer doses that they need to get. But they just announced anyone over 16 in Alaska can get the vaccine, regardless of health status. So, um, so yeah, so I think it's going to start moving forward as the as the production increases, and that's starting to happen pretty quickly. That's fantastic. Um, which vaccine will you be administering? Do you have a choice of that, or do they just send? send yeah, you, like, yeah, you just you well, you just get what you get based on your um, your ability to to store it and give it out. So we don't have the large super fridges, if you will, for the for the Pfizer vaccine. So we just have the regular freezers. So we can do either of the, the Johnson and Johnson or the uh, Moderna. And then in the beginning, we, you know, expecting that we're just going to be getting Moderna just because they're saving the J&J &J to get the teachers done faster because it's the one shot. And then as the J&J &J production ramps up, which they had just signed a contract with Merck last week, two weeks ago, um, to help them increase production. As that ramps up, we're just going to get a mix. And, uh, and it's, you know, we're, we're starting to send out notices to our patients, you know, that, uh, we're, we're starting to find it. The communication from the state is not as perfect as we'd like it to be. It's still pretty good. But so, you know, we're going to start to tell patients that we're going to get vaccine on a Monday and call you to come in for Tuesday for a shot. So they want it to, they're just kind of like, quick, quick, here it is. Go, go, go. But that's okay. That's, we're happy with that. We're happy to do it. So. Are there any other companies that are close to um, coming out with a vaccine? Or do you think that these are going to be our three in the U.S. for this year? Um, what do you think, Ralph? No, I think just waiting for the AstraZeneca in a few weeks to see uh, to see what happens. Yeah. yeah. Let's see if we have any other questions here. And they asked about the slides. We will post these slides to the chamber website um, on the COVID page. And I'll give everyone another minute or two if they want to submit a question um, into the block. And I'll just quickly give you a few um, updates on the chamber. Um, so tomorrow we have a virtual St. Patty's Day scavenger hunt hosted by PBN, Springford Chamber and PV Chamber. So a great way to connect with a lot of people in our area. Um, information's on our website. And then Saturday, March 27th, we will be hosting a shredding event. So if you have documents you'd like to securely shred, you can uh, bring those to our event, which will be held at PV Middle School East between 9 and 12 p.m. If you're bringing more than four boxes, please call ahead of time so we can make sure we have enough space. And um, last but not least, we have our annual meeting coming up on March 31st. Uh, this will be our first virtual annual meeting. And this one hour is packed with activities, including a year in review from Chairman of the Board, Kip Philo, who's out there in the audience today. Um, our general election of the 2021-2022 Board Directors, passing of the gavel to incoming Chairman Bob Clark, new member recognition, presentation of the Marvin J. Lewis Community Service Award to Mayor Joe Genta, and a keynote address by Mon Monco's Commerce Director David Zellers. He'll, his presentation is entitled Monco Strong from Resiliency to a Prosperous Future. So that'll be a great uh, presentation that we're looking forward to. And if you have any suggestions for future topics such as uh, the presentation today, you can share those ideas with us by just emailing info at pbchamber.net. Um, and sign up for your weekly e-news so you don't miss any of these events. Let me see. Uh, there was a follow-up on the question about, um, to Dr. Broker, are you taking everyone um, or is it just your patients? No, no, Any, anybody can sign up to get the vaccine. Just go right through the website and type in all your information. <laughs> and you'll see when you get to our, we, we have two sources in our office. We're getting some directly from the state 
Um, although that's been slow to come and I'm hoping that starts to come faster. And then um, we're working with a pharmacy that actually um, will come to our office and get doses. They, they have kind of a, the pharmacies have been getting doses before the doctor's offices have, and they'll come and administer some to our patients too. So when people go to our website, you'll see it's kind of two successive sign-up forms because we want to get signed up in both sections and whoever gets the first, we're going to give it to you. So. Yeah. <laughs> And is the hospital administering COVID vaccines? Yes, hospital is uh, still administering COVID. Again, it's all dependent on what the state provides. Uh, so now we're doing uh, second doses of Pfizer, our second round of second doses. Okay. And again, it's just, you can only register if you're in that category that's qualified at this time. So yeah, right. anyone who is eligible, uh, Tower Health website, uh, you'll need to activate a Tower Health patient portal, just like you have to do at Einstein, Mainline Health, Penn, Jefferson. So that's how all the notifications are occurring or through the patient portal. Um, and then um, hopefully you get notified and get called for an appointment. I think there's a lot of people out there that are on multiple lists. So perhaps and one... Yeah, Once they get called, it'll start going faster as we pull them off, right? So for Tower, it's uh, you're eligible if you've been seen at any Tower Health facility in the last three years, or you are going to be seen at a Tower facility in the next three months. So even if you only had a visit to an urgent care in the last three years, get on the patient portal, activate an account, register for, for vaccination, uh, and put yourself on the list, uh, as Renee said, put yourself in a, on as many lists as you as you can. And is there a cost for the vaccinations? No. These weeks? no. And looks like I think that's all the questions we have for today. Your information was very thorough. <laughs> we will um, again. I will post. Uh, the presentation to, yes, and I will be posting Dr. Broker's information too. We'll post um, both Dr. Broker and Dr. McMurtry's information on the COVID webinar page, um, along with a recording of this presentation and their slides so that you can access that and go back um, after the event or for, share it with anyone who may have missed it. Um, if we don't have any other questions, I'll let the doctors get back to their day. Um, I'm sure they have patients waiting. Let's see. Yep, that's it. Great. Thank you so much, time. gentlemen. That was very good. Yeah, thank you very much. Very, very informative. Thanks for having us. Thank you very much. Stay safe. Appreciate it. Well. Thank you. Take care, folks. You too, guys. You're on the front lines. We'll definitely get your vaccine. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Best of luck, everybody. Take care. Thank you. Thank you, everyone.